this is the paper that I am going to give in Lausanne at the 7th Annual Martial Arts Studies Conference. Uh, I'm recording this in advance as a kind of um, dress rehearsal, um, but I will podcast it the day after I've given the paper. Oh, well, two days after that I've given the paper. Um, so my title is Individual Practice in a Global Frame. Um, um, I hope that this will engage directly with the conference theme of martial arts, tradition and globalisation. Um, I want to do this by putting front and centre the question of our own implication and imbrication in martial arts, tradition and globalisation. And not just as agents of tradition and or globalisation, but rather in relation to questions of ideology, maybe even politics. My subtitle is From Asia Mania and Euro Taoism to Conspirituality. This evokes first a, bu a book by the German philosopher Peter Sloterdijk, Euro Taoismus, a work that was only relatively recently translated into English as Infinite Mobilization. The terms Asia Mania and Euro Taoism are taken from Sloterdijk's book, although the latter term, Euro Taoism, is perhaps better known via the work of Slavoj Žižek. This is because Žižek has argued repeatedly from 2000s onwards that what he calls Western Buddhism and Taoism are part of the hegemonic ideology of capitalism. Hence the problematic. If Žižek is right that this is the case, that Western Buddhism and Taoism are part of the hegemonic ideology of capitalism, then at least some of what some of us do, especially any Westerner who practices Eastern martial arts associated correctly or incorrectly with Buddhism or Taoism, might be straightforwardly ideological in the most pejorative of Marxist senses. I want to unpack, explore and interrogate this possibility. But I also don't want to exclude anyone, and not everyone here at the conference, practices ostensibly East Asian and implicitly or explicitly Taoist or Buddhist martial arts. So I will relate this all to questions of martial arts in general towards the end. The final term in the title is conspirituality. This term derives from a 2011 study which argued that since the terror events of 9-11-2001, the world has seen the dovetail with two hitherto ostensibly very different worldviews. Conspiracy theory on the one hand and spirituality on the other. These two worldviews have come to unite in certain contexts around issues such as distrust of the media, the state and big pharma. This has perhaps been seen most clearly in the last couple of years in anti-vax discourse. Thus, stated crudely, if there were a direct route between these terms, then the worst case scenario would be one in which the practitioner of Taoist or Buddhist martial arts must be a kind of ideological dupe or dope animated by an Orientalist Asia mania connected to an ideological mush that we might call Euro Taoism that has, since Zizek's first pejorative, pejorative theorization of it, morphed into a highly worrying ideological movement evangelical conspiracy theory, or what some people call the cosmic right. So this is our worst case scenario, that our Taoist or other martial or other practice is implicated in Orientalist, New Age, spiritual, anti-vax and or conspiracy theory. However, just to be clear that I'm not constructing some kind of straw man or scapegoat elsewhere in the next field or on the other side of the tracks. Here is a film of some of my own daily morning practice. Every morning, after having a cup of tea and feeding the dog, I first do the Baduan Jin, which is a series of eight stretch and relax sequences, each performed eight times. I then practice a chain of five standing Zhang Zhuang, Qigong, or Neigong postures. And then I do either the short or the long version of the Tai Chi form that I have practiced since 2003. And then I feel happy and well and ready for the day. At other times, sometimes in the same day, sometimes on a different day, I do 
or have also practiced other martial arts. For many years, I practiced Eskrima. For the last year and a bit, I've been learning Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I used to practice Choi Li Foot Kung Fu and kickboxing and so on. But each of these activities falls outside of the initial focus of this discussion. However, I will try to bring these other practices back in towards the end. First, I want to say a little bit more about conspirituality. Uh, there are a growing number of studies of conspirituality, many of which focus on specific aspects of the newness of the social and cultural world post 9-11. This newness has a name, social media. Social media has proven to be politically polemicising, playing with passions to produce and intensify positions via a hyper-real simulacrum of discussion or debate. However, I want to look a little deeper than the level of social media to identify some more fundamental sources of the problems that lead to ideological outcomes like conspirituality. My basic proposition is that the source of the problem can be traced back to certain conceptions of purity and cognate such as natural, clean, undiluted, uncorrupted, hence strong, and suppose sources of the pure, clean and natural, such as the ancient and timeless. Anthropologists and critics of anthropology from Johannes Fabian to Edward Said have long proposed that all of this leads us to fantasy constructions of the other, the alternative, the elsewhere and the elsewhen, including such repositories as the pools of wisdom of the ancient and mystical East. Many of us here will already be familiar with various versions of the theories of Orientalism, in which the East, the ancient East, is conjured up as an attractive imaginary category or fantasy solution to real and present problems in contexts such as the modern West, or indeed the modern East. This has been theorised under such terms as Orientalism, Techno-Orientalism, Virtual Orientalism, Primitive Passions, New Age Capitalism and more. As Kimberly Lau argues in her classic New Age Capitalism, we can understand modern consumer interest in ancient and other cultures as indicating a kind of quasi-critical, pre-political commentary on the problems of the modern world. So, doing yoga or tai chi, eating a paleo diet or inventing rituals with crystals won't change the logic, structure, power dynamics or problems of the modern world, so it isn't really a critical politics or activism but it illustrates anxieties and concerns of the zeitgeist. These arguments are well known, and they are fine as far as they go. However, with social media, so with Orientalism. I think we need to go further back than either social media or Orientalism in order to get a stronger handle on the logics and dynamics that could enable such otherwise different worldviews as Western spirituality and Western conspiracy theory to hybridize together. Key to this, I'm suggesting, is something about ideas of purity and strengthening. Now, purity, like authenticity, is definitely, in many ways, a conceptual red herring. But we cannot just jettison such terms. We may say we know that nothing in our human existence is truly pure, and we may well, uh, we may be well aware that the notion of authenticity is a minefield of conceptual traps. Nonetheless, at the same, by the same token, we all know that we can detect the inauthentic and the impure, and no one likes the inauthentic and the impure when they find them. So although it may be hard, maybe even impossible, to pinpoint the purely authentic or the authentically pure, in f the fact that it's so easy and common to pinpoint the inauthentic and the impure gives some clues as to the reason for the persistence of the ideas of purity and authenticity. As Jacques Derrida argued, meaning does not arise because of a fixed essence, but rather in and as the work of a structure without a centre. In other words, it is through the persistence of so many examples of the not pure and the not authentic that the existence of the authentic and the impure, and the pure rather, is inferred. 
This orientation always implies, and thereby works to produce or reinforce, senses of identity. It presupposes identity, and implies that identity is something with an inside and internal properties. Logically, therefore, if entities and identities are defined by their internal essences, then other entities and identities must be external. This tradition of thought, style of thinking, judging, organising, valuing, is what Derrida termed Western metaphysics, or the metaphysics of presence. Derrida called it a Western tradition of thought, although later scholars went on to argue that the metaphysics of presence is actually something of a global tradition. In Derrida's words, the attempt to keep the outside out is the inaugural gesture of logic itself, of good sense insofar as it accords with the self-identity of that which is. Being is what it is, the outside is outside, and the inside, inside. This is a theme that Derrida returns to regularly. The famous essay La Différence, for instance, deconstructs the idea of fixed and stable conceptual, semantic and semiotic entities. Violence and metaphysics reflects at length on the force of the binary inside-outside, and dissemination, from which I have just quoted, deems the attempt to keep the outside out to be the inaugural gesture of logic itself. Derrida thinks this type of thinking is Western because he finds it at work in the many Western thinkers that he wrote about. And he didn't read um, or write about non-Western thinkers, at least not in his early career. However, as many interlocutors have pointed out since then, from his first translator Gayatri Spivak to Ray Chow and beyond, this style of thinking is very probably also non-Western. But Derrida was always reluctant to discuss non-European cases, so he rather problematically designated this metaphysics as Western. The key point is that he calls it metaphysics because he thinks it's based on a kind of fixed and stable belief in the idea of the fixed and stable presence of entities and identities. What Derrida called the deconstruction of the metaphysics of presence, and hence identity, became more widely known thereafter as the deconstruction of essentialism. My interest here uh, is in the way that ideas of purity and strength can function as essentialisms. We know about appeals to the pure race, the pure place, the pure practice, the pure tradition, the pure diet, and so on. These are all ideological essentialisms based on the fantasy of keeping the outside or the impure out, and hence strengthening the self-same, the proper, or the inside. Peter Sloterdijk thinks of such processes as attempts to build immune systems, defence structures against external threats. In this context, martial arts practice is like many other styles of attempts to ward off the external existential threat, to keep the outside out, by developing the agency of the self via rituals of the body, what Michel Foucault calls technologies of the self, or what Peter Sloterdijk calls anthropotechnics. It's easy to see how the notion of purity might take hold of the self-strengthening subject in many ways. This is especially so when the here and now is regarded as degraded or impure. The logic runs, if so much of the modern is to be regarded as contaminating, this is because it's not natural or proper to the inside. When thought of as mass-produced, synthesised, mechanically retrieved, pulverised, homogenised, laced with sugar, saccharin, aspartame, stabilisers, preservatives, artificial flavours and colourings and so on, then the modern becomes regarded as foreign to the biological and hence the spiritual human. The connection of the biologically or anthropotechnically pure to the spiritual can be made in many ways. Kimberly Lau connects the popularity of aromatherapy to Orientalist and allochronic myths of ancient homeopathic approaches to health and well-being. From here, not eating, i.e. fasting, can be connected to the myth of being godlike, because the gods could only smell but not eat the ritual sacrifices. 
Hence the idea that fasting can make us more like gods ourselves, the peers. Sloterdijk argues that fasting, as practiced by ascetics, mystics and hunger artists, amounts to a ritualistic exercise designed to affirm mastery over, and hence to ward off, mortal threats, up to and including starvation from lack of food. Chris Goto jones in his study of the history of magic, has tied the figure of the ascetic hunger artist, exemplified in relatively recent popular cultural history by the figure of David Blaine, to long-standing images not of someone who can perform magic tricks, but someone who really is magic. In Goto jones study, such a person will always be orientalised because, in his argument, orientalism and magic always overlap. From here, it's only a short walk to the twin towers of muddled orientalism and incoherent masculinity exemplified by figures such as Gwyneth Paltrow and or Joe Rogan, who are pure and strong, respectively, in precisely the ways I am talking about. There is a lot to say and a lot that is said about both figures and what they can teach us about contemporary culture. But for now, let's just note that Paltrow's muddled orientalist hunger artistry on the one hand and Rogan's individualist alpha male energetic and pharmaceutical alchemy, or what might be called his bromeopathy, intersect in, for example, their respective health-focused rejections of COVID-19 vaccines. Each prefers to fall back on their individual ascetic anthropotechnic discipline, advocating remedies, rituals and potions that are far beyond the financial, temporal, logistical and practical reach of the vast majority of people, and whose two active ingredients boil down to nothing more nor less than the strength of one's individual discipline combined with the depths of one's pockets. Hunger artist Paltrow fasts and eats clean. Big pharma sceptic Rogan works out so darn hard, so darn often, and takes so many saunas that he has absolute faith in the power of his own antibodies and immune system to repel any outside intruder like the COVID-19 virus. My argument here is that the logic of trying to keep the impure outside out and the proper outside in, that Derrida regards as at the root of Western thinking, is aligned with Peter Sloterdijk's arguments about anthropotechnics. By anthropotechnics, Sloterdijk simply means exercises, physical rituals repeated with discipline and duration. Anthropotechnics or exercises are, for Sloterdijk, a quintessential illustration of what humans do in the face of perceived threats. They try to ward them off or in his terms, they try to build and strengthen immune systems. The individual martial artist is surely exemplary of this allegedly universal tendency of ritualistically exercising to train for the overcoming of the existential threat. Indeed, to transform training into the overcoming of the existential threat. Sloterdijk also thinks of all of this in terms of spheres. Humans always build spheres, he argues. Today, in the immediate wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, we might recall the notion of social bubbles. These would be spheres with an inside and an outside, designed to protect everything on the inside from the threats of the outside. These two suggestive ideas can be applied to thinking about our martial arts practice, both as illustration and as interrogation or provocation. To what extent is our practice an anthropotechnic response or a kind of repetition compulsion or drive that attempts to build a defensive sphere or immune system? What threat is our practice an attempt to master? In what ways does it go about attempting to ward off that threat? And what do we do inside the immunological sphere that we have built or entered? What is that sphere doing? In what ways? In order to ward off or repel what? With what consequences? We might think about these questions in any register, psychological, cultural, social, historical, ideological, whatever. We might think about the ways that we aspire to be like the ascetic hunger artist, who refuses to let the absence of food lead to death, or the strong man or woman 
who knows that the easiest way to lighten the load in the long term is to constantly add more weight in the short term of training or train hard quite easy or to invoke another of Sloterdijk's favourite images, the acrobat. As Sloterdijk tells us, the etymology of acrobat refers to teetering on tiptoes on high. The acrobat conquers verticality and thereby becomes closer to God. So Sloterdijk, following Nietzsche, views the paradigm of the acrobat to be the figure of the tightrope walker. For us, it might be the Shaolin or Wudang warrior who can fly through the trees the ninja on the rooftop, the archer, the knight on horseback, a capoeirista whose acrobatic spinning and tumbling defy normal verticality, or by contrast the tai chi or bagua master who is perfectly vertical, perfectly balanced, balanced, moving from posture to posture, or even the jiu-jitsu expert who rises up to the highest heights of victory by first going down to the ground and taking the opponent down much, much lower. In all cases, the question inspired by Sloterdijk's provocative image is, what are we attempting to ward off in our anthropotechnic sphere of acrobatic practice? And what is being built by that sphere, within that sphere? Perhaps then this takes us from philosophy to culture, ethics, ethos or ethia, and perhaps even to politics. In the past, Sloterdijk's construal of human rituality as an attempted immune system could have been regarded as a metaphor. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the image became literal. As COVID-19 seemed principally to attack the respiratory system, how many of us worried about the purity of the air we breathed and the strength of our capacity to breathe? As COVID-19 is a virus, how many of us worried about the purity of those around us and the internal power of our immune system? How many of us made quiet calculations and wages about the likelihood that we were strong enough to beat the virus at minimal cost to our health and our time because of our underlying levels of cardiovascular fitness, strength and health? How many of us connected this back to our devotion to our practice? Crucially, how many of us changed our behaviour with all this in mind thinking about our breath, thinking about our health qua strength, and thinking about our immune systems. In the period of the COVID-19 pandemic, conspirituality surged. Certainly disinformation on social media played a large part in this, and infodemic grew up alongside the pandemic. But the question is, what fears and systems of thought did the infodemic feed on and feed into? My proposal is that a combination of Derrida's understanding of the hold of the metaphysics of presence and its inherent essentialist and essentializing tendencies, combined with a version of Sloterdijk's approach to the centrality of ritualistic self-improving technologies of the self, aka exercises, reveals important subterranean forces in play. These forces conspired to make the pandemic environment ideal for reactivating myths of purity and self-strengthening. Ultimately then, approaching this in terms of Derrida's theorisation of what he regards as a uniquely Western, but perhaps global tradition of thought, Derrida always just calls it Western metaphysics, enables us to grasp that modern and or Western projections of modernity must be understood as paradig paradigmatically modern and or Western metaphysical gestures. These rejections may take the form of romantic orientalism or alachronism, and hence crystallise into fantasy attachment to ideas either of one's own or another's geographical region's mythic past, whether that be European Vikings, knights and druids, or ancient Eastern mystical martial artists, all sharing the desire to reclaim, reattain, rekindle and strengthen a lost purity. To recall Sloterdijk's terms of Asia mania and Eurotaoism, in Derrida's ontology these would be understood as largely overdetermined symptoms of a globalised and detraditionalizing modernity, making them almost inevitable consequences of Western identitarian thinking. The paradox I'm suggesting here is not merely that the Western turn east is a traditional Western gesture, but also that it is metaphysical 
essentialist and essentializing in the sense of being based on and strengthening identitarian thinking and myths of purity. This differs from Slavoj Žižek's Marxian interpretation in which the growth of modern interest in the ancient and or the Eastern amounts to a simple ideological response. Zizek's take is a simple hybrid of Max Weber and Peter Sloterdijk. From Sloterdijk he gets notions like Eurotaoism and Western Buddhism. From Weber he gets the notion of ideology as inscribed in material practices and reflecting stages of development of capitalism. Thus, to borrow Weber's examples, if industrial stage capitalism was oiled and supported by belief systems like Protestantism and end of the working week practices like drinking beer or wine, so late or postmodern capitalism is oiled and supported by belief systems like ersatz Buddhism and pseudo Taoism and practices like yoga, meditation, tai chi, mindfulness, and consumerism focused on purity. Interestingly, however, Sloterdijk, from whom Zizek took some ideas, does not actually denounce or disparage Asia mania or Euro Taoism. Instead, he activates a classic binary of surface and depth, in which a surface engagement with the ancient and the East would serve only the infinite commodifying energies of capitalism, but in which a deeper and slower or more sustained engagement could in fact generate critical changes that could be positive for modernity. In these two scenarios, Zizek imagines a meditating or mindfulness practicing yoga yuppie who works in a bank in the city. Sloterdijk, however, imagines someone whose immersion in yoga or critical Eastern or Western philosophy, things that Sloterdijk himself very publicly advocates, becomes more able to perceive and get off the conveyor belt. In all of this, Zizek plays the classic Marxist who regards religion or spirituality as the opium of the people. While Sloterdijk joins what J.J. Clark calls the long line of essentially progressive or critical Western Orientalists who embrace ideas of the East in and as a critique of the West. Inevitably, I am emotionally more aligned with Sloterdijk's theorist practitioner position than Zizek's aloof, as if from on high perspective. But Zizek's challenge remains valid. So what are we when we are both critical cultural theorist and Euro Taoist. The academic field of fan studies uses the term akafan to name a fan who is also an academic, an academic fan, who refuses to separate out these supposedly distinct identities. In martial arts studies, we are not simply akafans or academics who gaze upon an external object that they deeply appreciate. We are often pracademics, academics who are often first and foremost practitioners. As a pracademic, I have sympathies for the argument that not all Orientalism, not all Euro Taoism, not all Asia mania is bad or negative. It is sometimes what Gayatri Spivak, Spivak called an enabling violation, a crime, error, mistake or transgression that can nonetheless lead to good. Certainly, while the academic in me can see my own practice and relate practices as Euro-Taoist, Asia-manic and ideological in the most cutting sense, the practitioner in me can nonetheless feel their inestimable value. The re resolution to this problem requires reflecting on the frame itself. To appraise individual practice in relation to a global frame requires quite a zoom in to focus on the individual and quite a zoom out to focus on the global. As Frederick Jameson once noted, the bigger the perspective, the smaller and more irrelevant and ineffectual the individual can seem. As Louis Althusser had already taken this to the extreme, uh, sorry, Louis Althusser had already taken this to the extreme in proposing that history is a process without a subject. The point is, the global perspective can make the individual seem utterly irrelevant. However, although we can all acknowledge that we are all part of processes larger than ourselves, this does not make our involvement in them irrelevant or inconsequential. In fact, the problem with ideas of totality, such as the global, is that to evoke the totality 
is simply to conjure up an image, and one that is the very definition of the in general. And as I often caution my students, if you approach the world in terms of the in general, you're not actually discussing any specific thing at all. And the best that that is going to get you from me is a 2-2, about 50-55%. Rather than this, what one needs to do is examine the specific in terms of relevant salient forces and issues, what Stuart Hall used to call the conjuncture. Sloterdijk's image of spheres or social bubbles enables us to conceptualise our individual and group practices as efforts, consciously or unconsciously adopted ritualistic processes designed to build individual or group co-immunities against perceived threats. Hence, what matters is what takes place within those communities, as much as, possibly more than, and always at least in relation to, the conscious or unconscious conceptualisation of the external threat. As Spivak once put it, as soon as one draws a line, such as between inside and outside, or between us and them, here and there, one creates a differential, and this is consequential. Derrida's ultimate caution is that one must not collapse difference into opposition. Sloterdijk's efforts to think social structures in terms of spheres, atmospheres and forms of attempted co-immunities is an attempt to enrich our thinking on actors and networks. The borders between inside and outside are ultimately imagined, but no less effective, co-immunities. The problem with metaphysical discourses of spiritual or physical purity and strengthening is their resolute essentialism. The problem with conspiracy theories is their tidy, simple, simplifying and all-encompassing explanatory frameworks. The problem with these styles of thought is that they are too neat and tidy, too focused on the pure and strong, too aloof and ostensibly all-seeing. History shows us that there are innumerable risks and mortal problems with beliefs in purity and ideologies of self-strengthening, especially in relation to constructed senses of a threatening outside. The question for all of us, globally, in all of our little spheres and social bubbles is, what else are we defending against, other than our explicit alibi? What are we hiding from in our little words, worlds? These are the important questions. Engaging them with any competence or purchase requires going beyond two twin traps. On the one hand, the notion of the individual as independent, rationally self-interested and fully free unity. And on the other hand, the notion of the global as a non-multiple, non-heterogeneous, non-contradictory whole. Instead, as academics, what is required of us are ethically and politically sensitive cultural studies of practices and their institutions, institutions and their practices, communities and their co-immunities. While as practitioners, we must strive to produce ethical and progressive co-immunities via relational practices that become emancipatory traditions advancing traditions that always aspire to avoid becoming prisons. Thank you.